It's our time now. Let's get this shit started. Fuck you say? Saints Row 2022 is pretty disappointing. Not that I was completely miserable throughout my time, nor I expected to like it to a high degree. Even if I did ponder that it might surprise everyone with it turning out to be relatively good. It's just disappointing that this franchise comes back, showing that it's still willing to be stripped down and focus more on following trends than being more unique. Honestly, I didn't really follow this game up to release despite being a fan of this franchise. In fact, the talk about the controversial trailer got me to notice the mere existence of this reboot, and with the trailer itself being underwhelming with the feel, the tone, and the characters, I kinda just ignored it. I mean, how couldn't I at the time? Looking at the overall handling of the franchise by Volition, Deep Silver, and or other higher up by this point, only having Saintro the third having a remaster, the first two only surviving via backwards compatibility on Xbox, and a messy port of the second one on PC, the handling of Agents of Mayhem itself, all showing that they don't really care greatly for this series. I mean, it helps that this game easily disappeared from public thought for months until it was announced that it was going to be delayed, only for people to not give a shit. More silence than all the news pops up close to release. Really good sign there, I'll tell you. So I waited to get a used copy of the game, because its reaction to people criticizing the game really ignored the crap out of me back then. And after two playthroughs, well it's time to complain. Because I'm not recording myself playing a game and not making a video about it for, what, the fifth time? Now there will be some potential pushback with a few statements rivaling anything I say, so... Number one, reboots are fine with the original still existing, and they could do whatever since this is its own thing. Pretty faulty with that one. I mean, gaming preservation is getting better, but for how long? I just stated how the first two are hanging on by a thread, and three would have joined them, but the remaster fixed that issue, and four was close to the end of that console generation with a port that is still supported. Yeah, I'm gonna say it's pretty up there if they will still keep existing. Also, judging it for being its own thing is a poor counter-criticism. It's not like comparing Gears of War with Gears Pop, or Super Mario Sunshine with Paper Mario Thousand Year Door, or Power Tennis. It's still an open-world crime-based game with some additional or changed features. Hell, forgetting spin-offs, with game series like God of War that have some major changes throughout, you can still compare via how they handled their story and characters. Hell, most of my problems are with those last two with this reboot. But how dare anyone compare this to the past games? It's only taking imagery, names, activities, lines, and other references and similarities from those same installments, let alone being called Saints Row. It's totally unfair to compare. Number two, excuse X or Y because it's a comedy slash Saints Row. Yeah, not good for those who argue this game being its own thing and then excuse stuff because it's part of a franchise. But besides that, being comedic doesn't excuse poor quality. There are plenty of bad comedies out there. Shocker, I know. Let's just say that the fact that I had only 69 games installed will be funnier than the majority of this game. Even so, this is barely any more comedic or ridiculous than Saints Row 1 and 2, and definitely not as much as 3, let alone 4. In addition to this, there may be the bias or nostalgia counter-criticism. And with that, 1 and 2 may be the best ones, but they still have plenty of problems that I'm willing to point out. And hey, even if there is a hint of bias on my end, at least I'm going for proving why it's better, rather than just dragging down a genre or a franchise as an attempted counter-argument to something bad. Number 3. You hate it because it's inclusive now and not misogynistic. Real talk, is having strippers, prostitutes, characters like Shandi or Tanya being known for sleeping around or showing off cleavage and freckle bitches really misogynistic? It doesn't really show a hatred in women, you know what misogyny is. Hell, you could be a woman since the second game and Shandi is still a grand asset even in 2 and the sleeping around with her is seen as a joke rather than shaming her. Hey Shandi, you date anyone who worked at a place called the Pyramid? No. For real? At the time. The most memorable thing you ever did was get captured by your smoked out ex. That's not true. I'm sorry. And fucking half of Stillwater. Go team. I always thought you were just really friendly and hated pants. Someone gets it. And as for inclusivity, character-wise, are you fucking kidding me? 
In the joke making sense, the only real hard punching down as they called it was from Johnny Gat. Towards himself. Put these on. I'm yellow enough as it is, Dex. Or them shitting on his injured leg for being a smart mouth or a bit of a hothead. I thought I told you to be quiet. I got shitty hearing. Now you got a shitty leg. Johnny, your idea of a plan is taking the biggest hammer you can find and smashing whatever's in your way. Well, that sounds like a plan to me. Yeah, a shitty one, as your whack-ass robo-leg clearly proves. Oh, fuck you. Any others are all under satire. Parents, you might want to tell your kids to leave the room. There will be minorities in these photos. I really don't get this. They're trying to either gain points for shit they already did since the first game, or for their toddler level of humor, or both. And to pile on, the promotional material basically sets the boss as a woman. So it's kind of weird to have this kind of clapback, only to have a video game that has a mission starting out with the two women moping around, eating their feelings, and shopping to feel better. After one had barely anything bad happen to them, and the other had a mild setback of losing the job that they only had for a few days. Whoops. A quick side note, the player character in 2022 will be referred to as the boss, and the one from the previous installments will be referred to as the player to wear off any confusion. Number 4. Many others criticize this game. Get over it. Oh fuck. I'm so sorry, I forgot that there is a limited time anyone has to chime in on a piece of media and to dish out criticism before no one is ever allowed to make any negative videos about it. Fuck off. While I'm on this topic, I'm pretty sure I'm gonna repeat some criticisms from other videos. I wouldn't know of them since I've only seen two out of the dozens recommended at the time. I've ignored the majority of them prior to finishing this video to sway off any influence in my judgment. One hell of a binge wants to celebrate this video's completion, I'll tell you that. And with that out of the way, yeah, I expect more defenses that I can't think of right now. Oh well. Spoilers, of course, for Saints Row 1 through 4 and this reboot. Anything in the reboot will be judged on the entrepreneur difficulty with footage from my second playthrough. My original playthrough ended the day before the first major set of patches titled the Bright Feature Update were released and I started writing prior to the second playthrough. So there will be some amendments. One final topic is that my footage has some drop quality for space and I doubt that YouTube compression will do me any favors. So I won't say that my video is the best source for a proper visual judge of this game graphics wise. A lot of blah blah blahing I know. But all this is to say that I want to be as fair as possible to this game. But with all that said, funny enough, we're starting with... The presentation and technical aspect of this game isn't something to write home to at best. At other times, yikes. I mean the EULA is just white text on the sky blue background of the menu. Not a great first impression. Graphics wise, it's about what you expect from this series, looking about where the last three games left off, even if the remaster of Saints Row III looks better. The worst of it is some characters, especially the boss. With some footage I've seen, unless it's completely wacky or perhaps even the standard female they had in mind, they look out of place. Speaking of, there are some pop-ups at times, especially during the create a boss section looking like they're shifting through all the options when even selecting the same model, but in different clothing. But I'll give the knock towards it being published by Deep Silver, a studio that I've noticed doesn't have a good track record of graphical greatness, among other things. Textures popping in and graphics looking mid is nothing new for Deep Silver games I have experienced. Even bangers like Kingdom Come Deliverance and Chivalry 2 are plagued by these. The only one on the up and up is, again, Saint Row the Third Remastered, but that's only because there was a graphical upgrade slapped on top of the original version. But even then, there are issues from other Deep Silver Saint Row games, but a bit worse. The world still feels a bit barren half of the time with less cars and people. This is comparison to Saint Row 2, where you could be screwing around in your crib, only for chaos to break out outside. Random gang fights or crashes, just mayhem and you did nothing to cause it. We try to really give this city the feeling of a city where people are actually doing things outside of you. When night falls, you're going to see more sort of like seedy characters out in the streets and they're going to 
more crimes are going to happen at night. I've seen things where I'll be just walking around and a cop will all of a sudden come by and arrest somebody or just beat somebody down and then gang members see this happening and then they start to get involved and before you know it you're actually watching a gang fight that you had nothing to do with. After the patch there is a little more livelihood even if one major example I can get have cars clipping each other. It is more lively around the Marshall areas especially with the quickly established checkpoints. I'll talk more about that in the combat section. The driving is a little funky with physics. You heard it before a motorcycle can ram a fucking truck even though after patches, it doesn't cause the truck to fly up. But in both playthroughs, it's more like you can ram into anyone with any car and fuck them over. But you somehow get rammed and then you can get fucked over. Whoever gets rammed is the one getting fucked while the rammer, no matter the car, can go scot-free. Animations are pretty stiff and awkward for the most part. Takedowns are the pinnacle of this, which are at its worst at the final story mission. It's funny how the only takedowns that I've encountered without fucking up are the obvious fake ones for the LARP missions and weapons. See? This character doesn't even do anything after being shot. Oh wait, that's a bug. Yep, going there as well. I haven't gotten anything major outside of dropping through the map and the only two crashes along with two or three failed startups with my original playthrough. The Bright Future patch really did iron out a lot of bugs with only a few things like takedowns initiating T-posing or just not happening. Even if my experience wasn't too buggy, the fact that it's far worse for others is fucking nuts. I mean if I really pushed myself into doing another playthrough, I could have just uninstalled and reinstalled this game with my network connection turned off to get the mess that this game truly is. It really makes me wonder the state of the game before the delay to quote unquote polish the game. That is, if polishing the game wasn't just an excuse and a delay happened as a cause of the backlash from the reveal and the lack of presence soon after, along with the multitudes of competition it would have had with Elden Ring being top dog. Glad they chose a more dead time in gaming. Oh, the sound is just okay, no real problems there. Some of the voice performances are alright and some can be pretty poor. There isn't really much I can say, it was just mediocre competency. I've heard the radio is pretty crap, but I didn't use it due to the option to block copyrighted music in case of any important dialogue. Also, if you're gonna have the options to cut copyrighted music for streaming, there should be at least some original tracks for cutscenes and the like. I'm just saying that it'll make the ending and the credits less awkward with something playing rather than nothing. That is, if there was supposed to be copyrighted music there. Also, what the hell is up with all the damn Johnny Test whip cracks? Alright, I've changed my mind. The sound choices are bad. The combat is, well, what you would expect. Shooting shit in third person. Again, a mild follow up to the previous games. But instead of having grenades and the like, you have special skills. Where a good chunk of them is basically throwing grenades. I kid. Kinda. Most other skills are temporary buffs like being able to recover health by damaging opponents, or passive ones like increase health and slots to activate these abilities, all of which are unlocked as you level up. Perks are basically the same as the passive skills, but they have different tiers and you have to finish a challenge in order to unlock them as well as purchase the majority of slots. Both perks and skills aren't too hard to get, just play the game and you'll barely notice. It is weird with some of the skills on lock rates, like normal grenade throws are higher than planting one in an enemy and tossing them. Not bad, just questionable. Another big change is that takedowns, previously being a running melee move, are now locked as a more special melee move that will both kill weak or weakened opponents and recover health. A decision that can leave you low on health constantly if you're not careful, since any regeneration will only charge up your last bar of health, only partly help with a dodge roll in this game where majority of your enemies are using guns. Well, it mostly works, so again, not really a complaint, just confused. The driving is no more different than most open world crime based games, but with two additions to vehicle combat. Sideswiping for damage on the go, and then you can get up on the roof of a car for better aiming with better guns, even can hop across cars. 
The second option, along with the wingsuit you get for transportation, really feels like the studio saw this in Just Cause 3 and decided to add them without much thought. Minor diversion for traveling. The wingsuit is just kind of there as a middle way to travel. It takes time to get to a place to make great use of the wingsuit, and you get helicopters and a hover bike by the time the distances can get more lengthy. They try to make it more appealing by having launch pads that can launch you a good distance, but it's not worth getting out of a car to do it. Hell, you're more likely to just fly off to nowhere, maybe a few blocks, and just hijack a car anyway. There are some upgrades via upgrading the criminal empire, but by the time it could possibly make a difference, again, you have helicopters and a hover bite, as well as you'll probably be like me and be done with the story before then. But the majority thing, you can fast travel. Snap a picture at X or Y and you're able to go to that area. It's not amazing with it being limited to me finding only a few spots and not available during a mission. Compared to Just Cause 3 and the wingsuit is an addition to the traversal aspect the series is known for, using the wingsuit with the grappling hook, for example, can send you further across the land as you travel. Such a big map needs ways to go through it, and the game can set you up for such travel, with or without buildings in sight, let alone the jetpack-like wingsuit you get via DLC. Santo Ileso is just small towns with one major city surrounded by deserts, and even with most of it taking place in the city, like I said, it can be a hassle to get to a spot to use the wingsuit well, but then again it makes sense given this is the same franchise we're in 4, you can save hijacked vehicles to your garage instead of going to rim jobs like the other installments, only to give you super sprint a mission or two later, and a side mission that gives you unlimited sprint almost right away. Going back to combat and laying on the roof to shoot better, it has little use to you outside of certain missions and hustles, or in co-op. Again, going back to Just Cause 3, the majority of the game is within long stretches of roads and fields, so doing such a move usually can give some results before anything bad can happen. Here, you're venturing within towns and a city with plenty of cars and twists and turns, that by the time you're out of the car, you'll probably hit another car or crash into a building. Fuck around too much and you'll gain notoriety, aka an alarm that'll get the cops or any of the enemy groups on your ass. But it's not really consistent. Sometimes you could drive away or kill them all and be done, usually when it's very low but it can happen when it's high. But other times when the cop notoriety is high enough for the SWAT team, they can teleport behind you or just pop out of nowhere after dealing with the SWAT you just got rid of. And when roaming around the martial areas when they're looking for you with checkpoints around their area, it can be random if they decide to hunt you down or not. It's like the stag lockdown part in the third, but in that game, you automatically gain level 1 notoriety just for being in said areas. It can be annoying, especially when trying to shop, but it can wear out easily if not disappear once you're out of the lockdown areas without doing anything to provoke police and stag, the shops are pretty plentiful, and it's at the later half of the game so you should have good vehicles, including helicopters at this point, to make it a non-issue. Here, you can walk up to a patrol wandering the streets and they do nothing, but walk away from a small group and suddenly, they're on your ass. Drive through a checkpoint and it's up in the air if you get chased. The presentation is there, but the functionality isn't. Speaking of the enemies, the list is the simple gang or martial goons or officers along with quote unquote mini bosses a la the specialties of Saints Row the Third. It can be up in the air if some goons come out with shields to wither down before taking them out like the rest, along with the occasional waiting and or doing something extra for mini bosses. You can pick up generic ammo, but the only guns you can pick up are one offs that you can't keep. But then again, the enemies usually carry the same basic pistols and machine guns. You can only buy almost every gun you'll use, but there's little incentive to upgrade them. I've only done one upgrade on most of my main guns, maybe two on two of them, in my first run, and I don't recall upgrading any of them in my second, and both experiences basically played out the same. Compared to the third and four, where even grunts can get harder to kill. Funny enough, it's when cars are added to the combat that the amount of damage can vary. Any car you're in can tank so much damage, while any other car can be made out of tissue paper. I haven't even upgraded any of my cars during both playthroughs and, unless in high notoriety, 
They still can be shot up from one end of town to the next before the damage is at black smoke level. It's not a stretch to say that pretty much every crime sandbox game, let alone the other Saints Row games, have the damage dish out equally. The only times cars were weaker is with missions, usually when you can encounter a shit ton of other gang members. The lower durability is still in effect if you decide to drive one of them. So all of this turns the day-to-day -day gameplay into a near mindless experience bordering towards near effortless power fantasy. That can describe plenty of games, but when the only true challenge is to give a shit to win, it can say a lot. Now one last stop before the big chapter. Just for clarification, I'm going to categorize side missions as both the side hustles and the stuff mainly relating to the business venture side of the game. Essentially, they all are equivalent to the activities from the old games. And from what I've seen, it's just more of the same crap story and gameplay wise for the most part. I mean it truly says a lot when I have to admit that I haven't done any of the side hustles, let alone most of the business ventures on both playthroughs. They're really not all that mandatory to finish the story outside of completing a handful of business ventures. I just took the ones that were seemingly the shortest or the easiest to complete to finish a part of the business growth side story. And when I saw the three or so I did finish were enough to finish the story on the first playthrough, I didn't bother with the rest and followed suit on the second playthrough. As I stated before, they're basically the same as activities of the past, but the reason to do them are taken from the third and fourth approach to the activities, i.e. to just take over sections of the map and gain money and potential unlocks, i.e. weapons and upgrades. This is unlike 1 and 2 where while you gain unlocks and money, you use it to gain respect to proceed in the story missions. Now it is here and there whether or not it was handled well in 1 and 2, but my view on it is that there is a little bit of an A or B situation on how I feel about them. It is annoying to pause progress in the story to do the side stuff, but it does give you relief on the main gameplay loop to do something that's different, i.e. Escort, Demolition Derby, Fuzz, even Septic Avenger gives some temporary freshness. I have the same issue with this game when revisiting the third prior to playing the reboot, but not for 4 due to superpowers and the implementations in the activities. But in this reboot, from what I have collected of the side hustles and most of the business ventures outside of my playthrough, it's barely any different from the main game, making it feel very tedious overall. There seems to be more interesting side missions, but you have to go through the dull ones to get there, and is it really worth it? Is it really worth continuing on what feels like a slog of missions just to potentially get to something more enticing and different, especially when the main game itself can feel like a slog to get through just to finish the main story? Another piece of side content I just didn't bother with was the hit list stuff, unless I so happened to come across them while playing missions. Any bonuses didn't matter to me since I was doing alright with the mediocre slash weakish AI and the few guns I had or bought from Friendly Fire. It's all just to gain money as far as I'm concerned, and I make as much money as I need to just playing the game, so... Moving on to what you'll use the money on. Shops. Dear lord, the shops are a clusterfuck. I would give it some credit for having different themed shops for what seems like a diverse array of clothing, but it's been done before in this series with fewer shops with more in each of them. Here, almost every shop is unique, but with a low amount of options and only one of them spread across way too thin, making it more of a chore if you want a certain look. Jim Rob is the only shop you have outside of the apartment and the church, so a very limited area to store and customize. I'm really not sure if this was a thing during my first playthrough, but there are more spots for gym robs during my second playthrough, seemingly at warehouse looking places, making the context pretty off, but for the case of convenience for the player, I could give it a pass gameplay wise. Speaking of customization, for both the cars and the boss player character is… okay. For both of them, it has enough depth and feels like a continuation of the customization from Saints Row 2 before it got way too simple for Saints Row the 3rd and 4. I gotta give some props for keeping that up even after all this time. The only thing left are collectibles, nothing too much, just some items you can take pictures of, find in a dumpster dive, 
unlocked after a mission to decorate the church. Nothing amazing, just throwing shit in a rundown building as if it'll make the whole keeps into a lay so weird thing make sense. Throughout the city, you could bump into historical locations, some linking Ultor and Red Faction to this continuity as well. Because Volition got the rights back to the series, and they love this connected continuity idea with Red Faction and Saints Row, to the point that you think they're the only games they've made. Funny Saints Volition doesn't seem to care, like I said before, outside of references. I mean in Saints Row 4, these guys thought Genucci led the Ronin in Saints Row 2. But that kind of criticism is fitting for... Now I'll be honest, if everything I said previously was all that was up with this game, I wouldn't be making this video. The game is just fine at best so far, something to either just finish up and drop, or just drop during it due to a lack of investment. But it's the story, characters, and overall writing that gets to me about this game. With video games, there are various aims for them. Story focus, gameplay focus, or somewhere in between. Mini lesson in gaming for clarity. Story focused games are those that are more focused on the writing, i.e. characters and or the plot, and how it's presented. Think of a Plague's Tale or The Last of Us or something even like Phoenix Wright. Gameplay focused games have character focus on a low and the story, if any, is there to justify you going around doing the gameplay loops. Of course, very basic games like Tetris or any other contextless games are thought of, but I'd usually point to something like the Super Mario platform games, or early fighting games like the original Mortal Kombat and Tekken games. More recent entries in fighting games, as story modes become more of a norm to do, led them towards the varying middle ground between story and gameplay. Or games like Devil May Cry, 3 and 5 in particular, have a good focus on gameplay, but they don't slouch on their stories or characters. The Saints Row franchise, like many similar games, are a mixture of story and gameplay with various results. For me, 1 and 2 did well with story and characters with gameplay doing alright, the third is about average on both, and 4 showing better strides with its gameplay than its story. Here, it's no different with it being around the same as 3 and 4 and, well, you heard my thoughts on the gameplay. This is for anyone who would question if someone plays Saints Row for the story or the writing, something I've heard in one of the few positive videos on this game I've experienced. And I do. I kept going back to 1 and 2 for just that. It's to the point that I tackled the story missions in ways to string together the journey in both games, even listening to the one I have for 2 in a notepad. 3 is fine, but definitely not as gripping when I replayed it. 4 is the same for the most part story-wise, but it's the gameplay that kept it from being another Russian drop like with 3. And with this reboot, oh man, it's worse. Plenty of people wrote this game off as woke and SJW and all that, but it's not really. While there's certainly more PC written, especially compared to the previous installments, calling it woke just doesn't feel right. It's just lame. Lame, generic, pretty stupid too, but not in the over the top stupid like 3 and 4 mark the series with. It does have it here and there, but it's mainly within gameplay, something you can also say with the first two more grounded games. It just makes you question some of the decisions. The story itself can be summed up as an on the bottom and using crime to reach the top and potentially fall type of tale, all with the power of friendship guiding your way. For real? Yeah. Seriously. I would say this is some weak My Little Pony shit, but that is just an insult. The My Little Pony show, literally titled Friendship is Magic, is far more adult than this game, or at least quickly got to that status. The show insults the intelligence of grown children and adults far less than this game does. Some of the context of what you're doing and how you get to do X or Y just feels like they gave up at points. For example, for most of the game, especially the beginning, it goes on about how the gang needs money. That's how the side hustles are introduced after the payday loan store robbery. But that's it. Nothing about it comes up again in any shape or form. Why not have a sort of gain X amount of cash to progress? It can give plenty of incentive to do the hustles and can factor in on the story without that issue just being ignored until it's not. Fuck, the amount of money required can help with the church getting updated throughout the story, 
instead of being run down until the final few missions. Yeah, it harps on the respect factor from 1 and 2, but if you're gonna require players to do ventures for the business growth side story, and the final mission in a similar fashion, might as well do it in a few big story missions. Speaking of context in the story and world, oh boy this game fumbles. Even with no real reason to do them outside of gameplay and earning money, I could say the side hustles are fine since they started in the beginning where you're at your lowest cash wise. But business ventures? Why am I doing them? The boss isn't like the player where they specifically said, Don't take it the wrong way, Pierce. I'm just used to dealing with shit myself. The boss is clearly fine with letting the crew do things. Our crew does all the work and we sit back and collect money. Who trained the crew? We did. And who has the crew's back if they screw up? We do. Exactly. We earned the right to sit back and collect money. They even show some annoyance when having to do some of the activities, like picking up the radioactive waste trucks, or having to keep being called up for the cleanup crew. And with fucking brain dead reasoning to do some of them like produces fake records and documents based on real world data. It should be good enough to fool the fraud detection algorithm. That sounds really complicated. How about I just throw myself in front of cars and trucks and the harder they hit me, the more money we get. You gotta start questioning why outside of gameplay. Same goes with collectibles. Rummaging dumpsters makes sense and taking pictures of stuff is fine for fast travel. But taking pictures of something and it's suddenly in your possession to decorate the church? Really? Oh, when you're pointing out the bullshit of it doesn't excuse it. Or how about randomly collecting piles of drugs and money just sitting around, scattered across the map? You might argue this is pure nitpicking, but even the small things can show up people putting effort and thought into the product. Why are you doing the activities previously? Well, with one and two, it's to spread the good word of the saints and for the gang to gang, well, respect on the streets. Now, if you could bring me back some of them fine bitches who were turning trick to other pimps, I'd be able to start seeing some real money. But I ain't asking for something for nothing. I mean, you help me out, I'll cut you in on what the bitches make, and I'll spread the word that the saints are the real deal. In the first game, you're just one of the crew members doing what you can with some taking interest in you, and it's the same with two, but you're the boss. And again, I'm just used to dealing with shit myself. The third has it as you either taking over the syndicate's businesses, doing work for Kinsey, even the more harmful ones like insurance fraud, trailblazer, and the revamp escort with a tiger, were because of Angel thinking the player was soft and wanted to toughen them up. The random crap across the map was explained better with it all being stuff lost from the syndicate during the plane escape over Steelport in the beginning. Not too sure why the many power orbs in 4, but the logs were pulled out from the simulations of the other saints and the activities were used to disrupt the main simulation. Using the gameplay change of each completed activity means taking over more and more of it. Even if there was a little lack of context for the collectibles in 4, all the previous games didn't make you question why you were doing the activities and collecting if you chose to, unlike here. Some might say I'm putting importance to something small, but it's what makes the world and your actions mean a bit more, as well as When you do things right, people won't be sure you've done anything at all. And the opposite can be true. These small stuff can pile up. I mean this story started with you being buried alive under a huge pile of dirt, only for it to be pretty shallow when you pull yourself out. Or complaining about earning money throughout the story, but you're gaining access to helicopters and wingsuits, custom made ones as well since shirtless Kevin has one. The wingsuits are similar to the parachutes popping up in the third, pure gameplay bullshit. But the difference is that they acknowledge the wingsuits in story. Okay, I'm pretty sure you guys get the whole world building lack of context. It's just another sign of low effort for this game, and the first for the writing. Shame that most of the effort was placed in the focus of toning down jokes and quote, making sure everyone is in on the joke, unquote. Great, because it led to good gems like LOL, Kevin doesn't wear a shirt, no clue why. Kevin is shirtless, I don't know why. Seriously, one of the most recurring jokes is a character going around shirtless, but the big payoff is that he is forced to wear a shirt at the end. 
Okay. Not only your own fucking character can go around shirtless, let alone naked, but giving that a recurring look for idol members are shirtless men and women only wearing bras? I can guess why Kev, who was in the idols at the beginning of the game, is shirtless. Sorry to ruin such brilliance by explaining why it doesn't work. I will throw the game a bone and admit that the only time I fell for the humor was with the henchman of the final boss calmly giving you the location of the hideout. It got me on the first playthrough. Anything else fell flat due to either nonsense like shirtless Kev or because of the characters. But getting back to the story for a second, the main issue is that it's pretty short, making it fast paced with little to no urgency or build up for things, while, oddly enough, having some padding issues. It's why issues like money is just presented and tossed away, and it takes away a lot from the antagonists. Speaking of... The usual antagonists of a Saints Row game are the other gangs and factions outside of the gang culture, usually of a militaristic nature. You take out these opposing forces to take control of the city, or take over an alien empire with four. In this game, we have Los Menderos, the resident tough, car-loving gang, the idols, an anarchist cult looking to take down the system, Marshall, a private defense company, and the surprise final boss of the Nawali and his gang. And ho oh ho boy, you barely notice. According to HowLongToBeat.com, it takes 12 hours on average, and my time via footage recorded for both playthroughs are a little over 11 hours each. And man, barely any of that is used for the antagonists outside of establishing their presence. The Nawali and Marshall have a bit more to them, but the gangs, usually the majority of the Sancho game's focus, are bare bones to the degree that you have to ask why they are even here. It gets to the point of one having to look up some of this stuff after experiencing the game. Hell, even while playing, the Los Banderos name slipped my mind. The Banderos. It's not the Los Banderos. It's just the Banderos. Los means. Yeah, I don't care, Dex. They don't deserve the grammatical correctness the Canales received. Let's just get them out of the way first since I'm giving them more time than the game does. The Los Menderos game is just a typical muscle gang. Love a car, steal things on the convoys, and have a massive factory called the Forge. They are the basic gang, and that's it. At first they wanted the Hummingbird Codex to sell, even staging an attack on the museum and then an idol's party when they grabbed it, only to not care about it afterwards. Not too long after the party, the gang steals Nina's car and destroys it as punishment for her leaving the gang, only to have the forge get destroyed by the boss and Nina, only for them to do nothing and go on to rob a Marshall train. In the second Lost Banderos mission, you destroy this supposed headquarters and there is no retaliation at all. I mean, it has to mean something since Nina shows some concern for what they had cooking in the forge for the robbery in a mission right after blowing the forge up. I'll state about their story progression when getting to the idols next. But continuing, you reach the train robbery and near the end, Sergio, the leader, gets killed by the Nawali. And the Los Banderos gang is done with story-wise. You stop him at a convoy, fight them off at the museum and when they attack the idols, watch them steal a car and trash it, destroy their headquarters, and kill off their leader. Think of any basic gang from the past, and the Baderos make them look like hot shit. It was a sort of joke I was thinking of that Kilbane was a better big guy type leader, and it is hilarious because it's true. I mean, get rid of the wrestling talk, here's what Sergio should be. Kilbane immediately made himself the leader of the syndicate at the Felipe's death. He drew out the fight with the Saints and is furious when his leadership is in question, killing Kiki after she and her sister tried to get the Saints assassinated without his approval and are trying to stand up to him and take charge. He cares far more about being on top than the whole of the organization. Apparently in recent times, Sergio made the gang all about himself something outside of maybe one or two lines that isn't really explored. 
And with only two missions solely on the Penderos and the perspective never leaving from the boss or the other three saints for more than half a minute in total, there is no way of getting that properly shown to us. On the other side, the idols are an anarchist cult of a gang. They have the usual fuck the system and anyone that supports it kind of mindset and the goal of making a post-capitalist society. Real basic bitch anarchy group, but it's something. They mainly consist of party loving hippies who live in commutes with their leaders, the collective, being six members wearing draft punk like LED helmets and suits, owning mansions and yachts. Unlike the Beneros, they actually acknowledge the saints and go after them more than once. Wow! Amazing! Guessing Volition had more passion on this side of the gangs. They storm the church, they kidnap Kevin in an attempt to kill him, they indirectly inconvenience them by taking kids meal toys from freckle bitches. Okay. But, but that's before kidnapping Kevin. I'm sure the next one is far more they seal your mail. <sighs> Good lord. The last mission with them has you storming their boathouse and then their yacht with Kevin to take the hummingbird codex from them. Yep, that returns after everyone kind of forgets about it. Quick tangent on this damn book. This is held up as such an important item in the beginning. So much that the gangs wanted to steal it and Atticus Marshall is going nuts after it was stolen. But no news about them trying to get it back and it seems like the Lost Menderos, aka Sergio, cares to attack the idols not to gain it, but caused by a bruised ego. The saints only go for it to quote unquote look legit and that they're here to stay because the Marshall train robbery wasn't enough. I mean, they say that people claim that the robbery was a one-man job with the Nawali, but is really taking the book that better? And once you're done, it's just a collectible to place in the church. The same status as the infomercial knives you bought, some random junk guard, or a porta potty. A pure, useless MacGuffin. It being a MacGuffin is fine, but it's annoying how obvious it is by the time you grab it, and it's just tossed aside as nothing even when Marshall is on your ass at this point. But with that tension done and you gaining the codex while killing more of the collective, it's time to- The word on the street is the idols are in total disarray now that we've blown up their yacht. Looks like they've mostly gone to ground. For now, anyway. Might be a good time to move in on their turf. Oh. The idols are done story-wise. You storm them with the attempt to grab a book, and you end up crippling them heavily to the point of scrambling with one or two leaders left. I really don't know if this is better or worse than the Lost Menderos. With both of them, you respond to their deeds, whether messing with JR, kidnapping, or theft. You do like one thing during at least one of these missions that lead to harming the gangs, but it's more of a while I'm here kind of mentality rather than it being the goal. And then, poof! Their last missions have you storming their HQ and practically ending them right then and there. The only reason the forge isn't the ending of the Bentheros is so that the Nawali can kill Sergio instead of you, bringing in some questionable drama for the boss in their head for not being the one to end Sergio. More on that later. The biggest reason for these issues with the gangs are that they're trying to have both a linear story similar to 3 and 4, but with you tackling the gang separately a la 1 and 2, and having all of these enemies for the saints to fight with them trying to establish themselves as an operation at the same time. The combination of how the stories were played out previously doesn't work as you can see. After the prologue of each gang where they establish the saints, you can tackle the gangs in any order you want. Each gang story is self-contained with no worry about overlap with the certain bookmarks being the prologue and epilogue. You can go one gang at a time or mix and match in any order you choose. With 3 and 4, you are fighting one main entity throughout the story and even with the separate faction of Stag and 3, the Syndicate story has you tackle each gang that makes up the organization as a major focus one after the other. The Syndicate is the main antagonist throughout the story, so there is plenty of build up towards each would be end, with the possible exception of Felipe. And with Stag, they are brought in during the second act, where you're already knee deep in the Syndicate and their takedowns don't overlap until the end. 
If you brush past the build up for Stag, you can easily see them just as rust as these gangs in the sense of how you tackle them. But one difference that really helps is that there's always a trade off. Each attack usually brings retaliation on both sides. For example, Stag kidnaps Shondi, so you infiltrate their aircraft carrier and destroy it, only for Stag to put the city on lockdown with automatic level 1 notoriety in certain areas. The escalation of Stag made up for any rush aspect about their parts of the story that involved them. It wasn't just, they interfered with our attacks and we just took it. They fucked up our businesses and killed our guys and we just took it. And now, Nina and the Saints broke the forge. We're going to fucking take it! Or switch between being a nuisance, or a more dangerous nuisance, and just suddenly be defeated. It's funny with the amount of filler this game has, but it treats the gangs like afterthoughts. The fact that you don't leave the Saints and their point of view really adds to this. This is displayed heavily when you compare it to the old installments, where switching to the rival gangs can be highlights of their games, story or character wise. Through direct interaction or just switching to their side in cutscenes, you know who's running these gangs. You see their personalities, motives, how they run their gang, etc. Mainly from the response to your actions for a particular mission you just finished or of your overall actions. Just refer back to what I stated about Stag and the trade-off as one major example. More examples are characters like Benjamin King, William Sharp, and the General and Mr. Sunshine, shown to be more calm and collected to the actions of the Saints as well as shown as the Brains, with King and Price showing experience behind their decisions and their plans almost getting the player killed even before he was in charge. Even their lieutenants in the form of Warren and Joseph Price giving a contrast of being younger and more hot-headed. Miro and the Brotherhood show how running and leading on emotion and pure dick measuring can cause problems. Being a mirror to the player during this story where focusing on getting at Miro and sending a message didn't lead to progression, but the death of a lieutenant with Carlos. It was only after that, and one last shot at revenge, is what gets the player focused on the shipment and the beginning of the Brotherhood's downfall, with Miro getting into that mindset of running on emotion and losing everything by the end. A combination of these last two examples is in the Ronin storyline with the Ikuchi family. To the point that you can question whether Shogo could have led the Ronin to victory if it wasn't for his father joining in. Seemingly ruining ties and bringing Shogo down via insults and passing of blame to the point of desperation and his death. Then there's lengthy antagonists like Zaniac and Dane Vogel with constant interacting with the former and a lingering presence from the latter, even when he's not the focus. Even Killbane had the character quirk of treating everything as professional wrestling, seeing some of his tactics and speech drenched in that lifestyle. And only having his eye on being the one in charge no matter what is what brings his downfall, shown by him establishing himself as taking Felipe's place being contrasted by the let's get the shit started speech, showing the player is laser focused on the task at hand while Killbane has no plan. Even if he is one of the lowest gang members, he still brings some engagement, and that's the point in this. Just the lack of missions, engagement, plot, and character-wise, an overall look gives the idols and Los Banderos the sense that they should have just been tossed aside. But going back to a militaristic faction that locks down the city after some antics involving breaking in one of their facilities... Marshall, I'll admit, isn't as bad as the gangs. Prior to the prison break, any running with the Saints is purely business and there's no personal grudge on their end. The boss was hired there, promoted, then fired in a short amount of time. Nothing more, nothing less. Even the whole, the boss gives them the slip thing, is fine for me. They make checkpoints to find the boss and then the Wally, following with the Saints hijacking hoverbikes for the train heist during a failed search. The heist happens and then Marshall claims the Saints due to a non-compete agreement. A failed storm of the Marshall building has the boss and Maya, one of the board members, hatch a plan to usurp Atticus Marshall to gain the Saints back. Nothing majorly wrong with them, but there are some cracks. The checkpoints are appropriate, but again, the gameplay aspect fails to give it any impact. Even when you do get notoriety around the area, it at least should be harder to escape and or clear it in addition, there was no attempt to storm the Saints. The boss broke in and freed their high-profile prisoner, and they took it. 
Again, they took it when they hijacked that property and robbed a train. Admittedly, them going at it via the law makes sense, even if I doubt non-compete agreements work like that. Assaulting their interests, mainly their assets, leads to them becoming a technical competitor in business? I'm going to keep that as an unsure thing to point out rather than just a flat out negative. Another crack is shared among Marshall and the two gangs, the lack of physical threat. Pretty much right as they form the Saints, these three gangs are knocked down a peg or a few almost right away, to the point that a small army of all three are taken out by five of you, let alone constantly happening with like one or two. I get it, it's gameplay based and if it was true, you'd always die. It's a thing with video games, but the no shits given attitude the main guys have for the majority of the time, and pretty much every situation ending with a win doesn't really help it. The only times you have a huge crew with you is in the only mission after the PETA principle that doesn't end with a win. Technically. I will say the old games do have you go after the odds plenty of times, but a lot of the times you have plenty of your crew behind you. Even when it's a low number, it's not treated like it's no big deal as the tone of the reboot constantly gives. I really hate to sound like Johnny, but the best plan I got right now is to just go in there and take Angelo out. I'd be lying if I said I wasn't nervous about taking the fight to Angelo, but he's come knocking on our door twice, and I think it's time to return the favor. Unless it's with ballsy psychopaths like Gat the player, and even then, they're usually the only ones with everyone else criticizing them. And there were still plenty of setbacks or losses, giving some pushback from it just being a sweep. Nigga, you should buckle your seat though. It's questionable in the reboot to take these threats seriously when they lose quickly and share no real wins over the Saints. But that's because they want to save up any imposing threatening aura towards... <laughs> Like Marshall, there isn't a lot wrong with them. In fact, it feels like he was one of the better focused aspects of the game and the story. He is presented as this cold-blooded killer, hard to take down with Marshall having trouble. Although I will say the rush nature of him being friends with the game is an issue. Not helping with the mission playing off as one of those cartoon or sitcom episodes about planning the perfect day, the plans are ruined, and as the protagonist tries to apologize, it turns out it was wonderful. Lame. But I'd say what ruins him is near the end. He betrays the boss to take over their lives and to steal their friends from them. To keep them safe. What the fuck? Doing all this to take over the saints and the empire, I get. Even leaving the friends alive, I get. But there was nothing that I can think of to having them play pretend to feed whatever happiness he gains from this. He's a killer, not crazy. There's a difference. Wanting the boss gone due to some still lingering resentment from being incarcerated by the antics would make sense if that wasn't dropped in favor of the idea of the boss apparently being a bad friend and weak. It just feels like they only did this turn to have a final boss, which isn't bad in of itself. Like I said, having him do this to take over makes more sense, like he wants what he lost, i.e. a gang and a huge president Santo Ileso, and some revenge from the person who took it from him. But having the motive being, I'm the better you so I'm taking your place, they're my friends now, deflates this quite a bit. Finally, we get to the Saints themselves, the main four characters, and they are Bring and or represent the worst aspects of this game. These characters are pretty cliche to the point that the most positive section of the game for me, the LARPing side story, you can just swap out these characters with any other nerd and their non-nerdy friends. Eh, makes sense, have a cliche generic story and fill it with cliche generic characters. Funny enough, as I stated before, the problems of the writing is shown through the characters, mainly the saints themselves. When it's not all cliché writing, it's a hint of some questionable decisions or hypocritical views without a sense of self-awareness or satire, or have some shots at specific political topics that people help link this game into being woke, like wanting to take a certain car to improve one's carbon footprint. 
but how they treat it is to just bring it up and say it, rather than to make a point about it. Shredded Nerd made a video about this type of writing, along with some issues about how they write characters like these saints, i.e. model them off the well-off inner-city young adults from places like California. I say go check that video out. Going back to the topic of them being cliche and generic, it's not bad on its own, but what you do with it that counts. I'd say writing characters like this can help when you have it serve in a more gameplay focused experience or when you're doing something different with it story wise. I'm pretty sure there are plenty of people who judge Kratos in the Norse era God of War games as the generic older man learning to open up or be more humane through a young child. But it stands out more from similar stories like The Last of Us or The Road due to this following after the Greek era of God of War. Having all of that as, essentially, the backstory of this new era brings more to what many people said back in the day as painting The Last of Us with some God of War. Or with stories like The Last of Us or just playing comedic games, just make sure the execution sticks to landing. And with this game being comedic, well, I'm pretty sure you could guess the execution. Starting off, Kevin is the life of the party himbo type. He is the typical inversion of the tough guy, being the more muscular member of the group, even if he is a bit lean for such a role, but having a trait that one wouldn't expect him to have, usually being into baking, which he is. He, along with the boss, best contribute the not giving a crap attitude of the game when it comes to the antagonist and the laid back nature since most of his solo missions are the ones that help give the whole pointless vibe throughout the game. Even moments meant to be taken seriously with the threat of death. Oh no, we're dealing with the Nawali. Let's take this time to have a big payoff to the shirtless running gag. He wears a shirt and then, first thing out of his mouth while fighting, is him saying that he can't wait to get rid of this shirt. He's like that comic relief character that's just there for jokes, to the point that you don't even believe any form of seriousness they could bring. It's kind of hard to explain, but it, along with a lot of the comedy, is in that same sort of tone of when a character says something normal or is serious about, to us, a ridiculous situation, or, usually to set up a joke, when they say something obviously stupid, but they believe it as fact. The most serious he ever got was when he was told to shoot his roommates for the idols, a choice you don't believe he would have made. Kevin, along with Nina, really don't give a fuck about the Ayers or the Benderos, respectively, even in the beginning. One would question how these two would end up being roommates in the first place, but it doesn't matter given that them being part of the two gangs are a non-factor outside of who is following you during missions that regard those gangs individually. In Kevin's case, he describes them as family and wants the boss to go easy on them, but he just brushes off the boss killing any of them right away. There's a fucking roommate code about this, and doing anything to disrupt the gangs is met with folding laundry or some other chores, as if the boss ate either one's leftovers or deleted one of their shows off the DVR. Nina is the tomboy all about art, family, and cars, being labeled as a great driver, even though she barely drives. Only a handful of mediocre chases and a move that even late Saint Row would call ridiculous. Then again, there's just as much attention on her interest in art and, surprisingly, even less on her focus on family, both her real one and of her gangs. Again, it's a non-factor on her being part of the Banderos. She states it changed from a family only to only be about Sergio, but, as I already went through, nothing shows it. Just saying it is good enough, am I right? Shire acted like she had most of her body out of the door, just needed to get that lingering foot out. The only thing it leads to is the destruction of a big important car which turns out to be her mom's. This scene has been mocked and ridiculed to hell and back, and it's not hard to see why. It feels like a checklist of what to do to make a dramatic scene, and the performance doesn't help. No! She never let anyone else drive that car. Who? My mom. Ah, fuck. 
to getting that, it's over a card you only see once and Nina used once in the beginning. She said she won't use it for the payday loan robbery, but then uses it to get the boss away from police custody with that dumb trick I talked about earlier. So not risking it for rent, but uses it to help her friends. Fine, understandable, even though, let's face it, it's the same thing in this case. Anyway, hey wait a minute, she says she's using it to save her friends, but she only does it for the boss from jail, Should she doesn't bust it out when Eli and Kevin could have been killed in a shootout with idols and Los Banderos, which almost happens when Eli gets shot during it. Makes you think, huh? But anyway, that's all we get until it gets stolen. She's pissed, but also pretty chill about it in between the call and learning that Sergio is about to destroy it. Instead of just being pissed and almost desperate the entire time with how much baggage this card has. And after you destroy the forge as revenge, nothing! Nothing about this ever comes back and she acts fine. Revenge good, I guess. So even then, you don't look back at this and care, even when it pops up in the boss's head in After Party. I'm pretty sure this was an attempt to gain some sympathy towards Nina, kind of like how the writers tried to do with Kevin with him bringing up that he was in a foster home. The difference between the two is that while both of them come and go, the latter feels more natural for the situation, and the former has this huge spotlight on it, which making it come and go feels worse. She doesn't develop in any way after this. She gets mad, and then it's back to business as usual. Like a Phil episode, you can ignore it, and it doesn't change a thing. The issue of her that connects back to the general writing is the messed up morals. Weird to say about an open world crime game, complaining about the morals of our protagonists. Well, it's not the fact that they rob, kill, or deal drugs. It's the fact that they rob, kill, and deal drugs with some sort of moral high ground or judge another for their actions while doing the same or worse. This was never fucking yours. 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 They call Marshall morally bankrupt, but there is no scene showing that. They just do their job as private security, and even their lockdown is just there to capture dangerous criminals when escape from their own custody. And it's only in their section of the city. Atticus Marshall stating that lives were meaningless in exchange for the Codex or when the Saints stormed the building can be harsh, but tell me, what does a lack of caring of human life matter in a world where the hired killer business is pretty public with the Wanted app? I mean, how gung-ho the boss is. Fuck, they kill the Marshall lawyer for being a bit smug and almost get the creators of the Wanted app killed just for upholding policy. But oh, having businesses and dealing drugs, a body slash evidence cleaning, and toxic waste dumping, potentially in residential areas, are the things people with rich morals do. The gang, admittedly, are not too delusional to not call themselves criminals, but Eli and Nina are the ones trying to reframe what they're doing at times. At least with Eli, it's in the pursuit of everything being a business and the Saints being a legitimate company. Nina, being an art lover, changes any illegal thing they do considering art into something else. Throughout art appreciation, she wants to join the art life legitimately. Each failed attempt to buy art leads to them stealing it. At first it's fine, she was breaking down and then admitted to just stealing them, but then she flipped back when being called art thieves. What really annoys me is the fact that they want to draw a line at what level of criminals that they consider themselves to be especially with the justifications they want to make. It's fine to rob the payday loan place because the owner is a dick. The art owners don't appreciate the statues, so just take them and call yourselves art liberators. Commenting on robbing an armed truck being a victimless crime or it's insured money. I just have a feeling with all of this, they want the saints to appear more naturally good and likable. It just doesn't work to downplay crimes or have them say stuff like donate the stolen fast food toys to orphans when I know it's all bull to make these characters seem like not bad people who rob and kill whoever with the same it's a fun time attitude you see in quirky psychos or even the odd similar treatment for operators for games like Call of Duty as of late. 
Let alone the fact that this kind of stuff gets dropped or slapped on like a sticky note. Fucking idols. They really are a bunch of thugs. Taking joy from children. Fuck children. I took joy from you. Buckle up. Nobody liked Johnny Gap because he was the kind of guy to pause a shootout to pull some stray pups away from the action. They liked him because he was a fun character with plenty of good interactions. There isn't a redeeming aspect to Dane Vogel, but again, great character that people like. For fuck's sake, the best version of the player for people is from Saints Row 2, where he is the most psychotic and brutal. What's this? Do me a favor. When you check the trunk, just remember you should have offered me something better than 20%. These and other characters are popular because they're good characters one can latch onto with what they bring. No one likes to be lied to is what it comes down to it, and no one likes hypocrites. Ones that state the saints are for the people, but only terrorize them. Fuck children. Ones that have to make sure the payday loan place is run by a dick to rob it, only to steal some cars to do said robbery. Eli is the closest thing to the brains of the operation. He, no joke, is the only one that has some sort of development in this game, or at least one that makes sense. He starts off as one that acts so above having a 9 to 5, trying to make it as an investor. He is obviously the type to wait for success than to gain it, ironically being into some sort of career motivational speeches and the like. He isn't the one you would trust with the gun, being pretty green with crime life, but once the saints are formed, he is the one to plan out everything he can to make it more of a legitimate business than just a gang. And the good thing about him is he is willing to improve himself, wanting to learn to be a better shot in order to be more useful for future shootouts, which happens later on. The only thing about him that has me scratching my head is that they made him into a nerd in the D&D sense with the LARPing. It feels like just because he's the brains for the most part, they have to make him nerdy to that point since he never felt nerdy outside of the clothing. It's one of the only things that wasn't generic about the writing, only to make it generic. But that's really it. He really is the best out of the saints. Last, but maybe not least, we have the boss. As stated before, Volition pretty much primed this game to have the brown woman plastered across the promotional material as being the first playable character outside of Johnny Gat to not be customizable. And honestly, they should have just stuck to it. After both of my playthroughs and seeing other non-ridiculous creative bosses, whether from the handful of reviews I've seen and other playthroughs during writing, I could not see any of them doing or saying the things the boss does in the story. People made established characters like Tony Montana and the Joker in Saints Row 2, and they fit far more in that urban gang setting than any Joe Schmo playing the boss in this game. Now speaking of the player, I will make comparisons between the boss and the player since, well, the boss is, in many ways, the player from 3 and 4 just underneath, again, millennial writing. The player in 3 and 4 turned more towards an action movie hero type, having some badass stunts and some gags and gaffes. The boss is trying to be like that, but leans in towards the psychotic nature the writers back then wanted to push the player away from. I should have realized a prison of peace would never hold a sociopath like yourself. I'm more of a puckish rogue. A rose by any other name. But still doing normal stuff like karaoke and binge watching TV shows, as if making the criminal aspect more quirky. That, with the writers trying to make the boss into a badass, just doesn't make them as endearing as the player especially when they have a few spots of the boss whining and the start of an entire mission being them wallowing in their own self-pity, or the storming of Marshall feels like, as Atticus states in that very mission, a temper tantrum. Loser! You're a loser! Are you feeling sorry for yourself? Well, you should be, because you are dirt! You make me sick, you big baby! Baby want a bottle? A big dirt bottle? I mean, when the speech hyping up the gang has the energy of a disgruntled medium wage worker, you can't take it seriously. Especially with the context of this obvious projecting being known as the boss being chewed out because they didn't listen to their boss, practically did the same thing but had reason to this time and was rewarded with a promotion on their second mission, only to get fired because they failed to secure a major artifact. I'm glad to see it's all bullshit. 
Also, nice to see that after all of that, they have a grudge against the two to the point of being motivated to ruin Gwen's fun throughout the LARPing side story. But Maya blatantly threatened them after getting what she wanted and nothing. Nothing said after that. Not even right after leaving, just saving it for a general fuck the group during the Saints party. Watch out folks, such a badass right here. The writers tried to develop a little over halfway into the game in a way to try to differentiate the boss with the Nawali to build him more as the big bad. The only siege prior to it is the Nawali pulling one over the boss and almost taking them out in the beginning, but it kinda means little when not only the boss doesn't care about it, but they still got the Nawali captured. Would've helped if he was still out there and the boss encounters and recruits him in another way. An idea of mine is during another martial attempt to catch him. The Saints learn about it after discussing the possible train heist, sneak their way inside wherever the Nawalis hold up, and find a way to give Marshall the slate with the Nawali tagging along. It can show that he is the boss's better and the full potential of Marshall with a huge army after the now failure of the first mission, which also would give that threat Maya laid out some credibility. Don't go mistaking us for friends. This was business. You interfere with Marshall again, and you'll get the horns. Oh, oh, scary! Oh, 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 shiver my timbers! Shut up, man! Moving on in the timeline is the Perfect Day episode mission, with the gang having a fun time with the Nawali to build a bond. Here, they try to show off one of the differences between the two with their view on what they do with the boss saying, hey, I murder with gusto. I, I just... Don't you ever want a day off? A killcation? No. Oh. The Nawali rejects this as if stating that he is a full-blown killing machine at the snap of the finger. But funny thing about that is... <laughs> I'm a walking murder party. Y'all had me at murder circus. You... you are aware that didn't solve the issue, right? Yeah, but he was being a dick. Back to murder. Murder can't solve everything. You shut your mouth. No actual killing of players. <sighs> Fine. Fine? Yes, deal, okay? For a game, you're really taking the fun out of it. If I have to say more about this, well, you probably need more help than these two psychos. So they grow a little closer during it and the heist, only for the Nawali to stab the boss. Laying out his motivations and this leads towards the real attempt of development of the boss. Being to replace the boss in their friend group due to not being able to protect them and the boss being a poor friend. The thing is, they're not in any way. The game is so focused on having them seen as the best of friends that there isn't any real friction or poor interactions. They barely even snipe at each other for fun. The issues that bring such doubts are pretty shoulder shrugging. In fact, there is no real reason why Kevin would think of the boss as a bad friend. The thought of Nina having that feeling over the boss not being the one to kill Sergio what? There wasn't even any talk about killing him at any point, and he just drops down from the helicopter boss fight style, and then the Wally just kills him without the boss being able to do anything. This is, again, used to make the Nawali look better for the final fight, but changing this to an actual boss fight with it ending with Sergio stopping the boss from getting the kill shot and then the Wally stepping in to get the kill would have displayed this better. Or at least have the cutscene feature the boss struggling with Sergio before the Nawali steps in. I know the joke of it is a subversion, but it harms the story by doing it this way. Even then, she jokes about it once after this, not really sounding like she really cares about it. The guilt over Eli getting shot, yeah, that one has more ground, but them joking about it or mentioning it in passing doesn't make me think it was that important. Even during the mission where he got shot, jokes and a dismissal pop up throughout it. Who could touch us? Oh, we just took on two crews at once and walked away just fine. I was shot. And you're getting a sticker, so quit bitching. And the whole, my friends are my strength tone the story turns into is pretty flat since a friendship feels weak. As much as I said, the game tries to display them as the best of friends, to have the two that are gang members quickly drop their flags, the Mang Saints gang act like the kind of people who are friendly but just barely know each other, like they haven't moved away from non-hostile roommates just barely being friends and still tiptoeing around.
Like, they'll know surface level stuff about each other, but nothing deeper than that despite being so ride or die with each other. The uncertainty of their time together as roommates makes it either feel like it's a pretty rushed state of loyalty, or it's been a long time, and yet they are still this skin deep when knowing about each other. But the biggest point against the power of friendship theme and the whole, my friends don't need me, I need them thing is that, no. These guys really do need the boss, maybe a bit more than the boss needs them. At the beginning, they're almost parasitic with all hopes for rent on the shoulders of the boss and their paycheck and the potential bonuses. Eli, again, is acting too good for a 9 to 5 and depending on investments and is wishing with one hand and shitting in the other. Kevin is only doing DJ jobs for the idols and, well, they're not gonna pay him anything, I can tell you that. Nina is the only one attempting a job, but it feels more for a love of art rather than to pay rent. After the robbery, it's on the boss to do side hustles to pull in the dough, and even during most of the game, it's always on the boss to do everything. At the end, during the first phase of the Nawali fight, the boss is left on their own. Like always. It's shaped up more like an anime in similar vein to Yu-Gi-Oh! where it's all about the power of friendship, but only a small part of the group is in the action, while everyone else are mainly cheering on with only small moments or opportunities to be a part of the action. Maybe less in fact with the boss being more of a lapdog even more than the player in Saints Row 1. Having the people working underneath them constantly having the boss to do the work. To fully prove both points is one simple act I keep repeating. Nina busted out the super important card to help the boss out of potentially getting busted by the cops, but not when Kevin and Eli are in danger of DEATH within a shootout. Not even offering to be the one to drive with her supposed better driving abilities. What does that say about their friendship? There isn't much left I want to talk about in terms of the game, and I stopped both playthroughs after killing the Nawali. All that is left is finishing up the business ventures and the missions linked to them. That's why this isn't a critique or something like that. As stated before, the game in both playthroughs didn't got me invested to do the side stuff outside of what I had to do to finish the main story. Hell, I did even less in the second playthrough. All that happens is, outside of any stories within the ventures, is three missions with two of them on the police investigations on the Saints, or the Purple Shirt Mafia as they call them, since after all the crap they've done, of course they wouldn't be noticed even though the news reports name drops the Saints. The boss helps JR out of a jam and destroys evidence because the police don't know their true name but knows their businesses and from intel Eli somehow got to raid the church. COMEDY! <laughs> the boss and Eli decide to intimidate the police chief into stopping the investigation, which works. Because this definitely wouldn't bring the full force of law enforcement and other departments after threatening the fucking chief of police, and she'll just keep her word to drop it. But then again, she is so stupid that she confirms blackmail details Eli had on the cops. So again, the sign of any struggle and then it's dealt with right away. Oh, I am so invested with the saints plights when everything comes easy for them. Then they build a giant skyscraper and they finally have the karaoke party in a sort of dreamworks like ending with other characters dancing, enjoying in on the singing. This is juxtaposed with DreamWorks recently dropping a kids movie far more mature than this game will ever be. But I guess the dancing slash singing ending you find in children's films matches this game. What a wild ride. So the big question after all of this is, well what now? What does the future hold and how screwed is this franchise? Well, at launch, it topped the charts in the UK for physical copies. Also, another chart topping with all of those asterisks, but adding for the PlayStation 5 version as well. But the next week passed and sales dropped by 80% in the UK. Pretty silent everywhere else. It was reported that this game cost $100 million and supposedly it flopped. Hard to get a clear answer on that. And within a few months after release, Volition was transferred to work underneath Gearbox. 
Embracer Group does state that they're happy with the financial results but are saddened by its critical reception. Yeah, not buying it. There is no way a major company like this is that caring for critical reception to this point publicly. And I'm proven right after learning that later on, they admitted that the game had a lower return on investment and it underperformed when the, at the time, recent financial reports were out. But I will say, they're not like an Activision or Ubisoft in the sense that they're obviously in it for the money regardless of quality, and they are not one of those companies that have a bad reputation or poor press across the internet. I mean, no one was really thinking the worst when they purchased Crystal Dynamics and EDOS Montreal from Square Enix. Everyone seems generally okay with Embracer, so some benefit of the doubt will be given. Then, at the end of March and the beginning of April, a roadmap was released displaying some minor details about the DLC for this game, showing story and regional expansions. As of recording this voiceover, the Heist and the Hazardous DLC has been released. And no, I'm not going to do them. I have so much disinterest in wrapping up the business ventures and that little side story of upgrading the criminal empire. Why would I want to do more in a game so lacking in the base game? I know there are plenty of DLC expansions that are amazing, but they are still within a game that have a solid base. It doesn't matter how good the furniture is if the house looks like shit and isn't built on a solid foundation. I'll probably talk about it writing wise if it does something like bring in old characters to this continuity like Kinsey, Pierce, Ben King or Johnny Gat, which I'm pretty sure they'll do. They'll somehow bring in stuff that was from the previous games into here in one shape or the other. I mean in the wall it already feels like a different shade of the player and or Johnny Gat, so why not bring in the original? Whether they do that or not, I'm sure it'll just be more of the same of the base game. Maybe bring back old activities or create brand new ones. Nothing spectacular or groundbreaking. As for any future titles, it's hard seeing a sequel for this game being made after such a reception. Referring to what was said about the financial report, they are knuckling down on which projects will be greenlit, and no way they would want to go back to this, at least when it comes to new installments. But if they do make a new installment, given that Volition is now under Gearbox, I don't think much will change, especially in the writing given some of Gearbox's recent titles. I feel the same if they plan on truly going back to the well and remaking the first game. The only possible thing to do that I see as positive is to remaster the first two games and maybe four in the same style of the third game. But since they skip one and two in the first place, they may not do it. Hell, they practically said they weren't gonna do it. Although, desperate times. I mean, they can't do the same thing Capcom did with Devil May Cry and do a sequel to the original games, since this is technically an incontinuity reboot due to the events of Gat Out of Hell. Same way Agents of Mayhem is technically an incontinuity reboot. Maybe they'll bite another bullet and do something like Saintro Online in the style of GTA Online with activities and self-contained and or continuous story missions a la the heist in GTA Online. Why not? GTA Online has in a way became more like the later Saints Row games with how ridiculous it got throughout the years. Going back to countering the backlash, the few positive videos I've encountered, like most media with such a negative reaction, you get the it's not that bad or it's fun as if that in of itself is a counter to any negatives. Sure, you could have fun despite the bad, but that's it. Anything bad doesn't stop being bad just because of any potential fun one could have. Yeah, sure, the characters are crap, the humor is horrible, the map sucks, and the gameplay is below average, but I had fun, so... Yeah, that doesn't sound foolish. But one of the comments I hear is the combat, the bad humor, and the writing, saying that Saints Row was always like this. I'm pretty sure at this point I don't need to say that is wrong in general, and when it did do similar things, people didn't like it. The best example is Felipe. Like some of the villains here, he barely got any screen time before his sudden death. You can say it was a sort of joke that this big bad leader was killed quickly, perhaps seen as a subversion given it takes a while in the previous games. But it was still a letdown, especially with someone like Kilbane being his replacement as the big bad. 
I find it funny with some of the reception of this series. One recurring aspect of placing anything after 2 to a high pedestal is by crapping on the previous games, because to lift something up is to lower something else down. Another is that this series, when it was seen as a GTA clone, still has the most originality, not being plastered with pop culture or taking ideas from other pieces of media, whether gameplay, setting, or story-wise. But all that wasn't a true knock on people who like these installments, let alone this reboot, and me being a massive dick about it. I can see why you can have some enjoyment with this game. In a sense, you can find enjoyment in most open world games. Wait, why didn't it switch to... Ah, there we go. Despite everything, I can't really say I really hate this game, or made this from any hatred for it. At least not any that didn't fade it away over time. I did have a love for this franchise, if you didn't catch that I do already. Saints Row isn't the greatest series, even its best game I wouldn't put in a non-subjective top 10 best games I've ever played list, but when it's good, it's really damn good. The biggest hot take I can give is that I enjoy the first two, let alone four games better than any GTA game I've played for a lengthy amount of time, which is so far GTA 5, Online, and San Andreas. Saints Row is just that good to me as a series, which makes it disappointing what happened to it. Hence why I titled this reboot as disappointing. It's bad, but it doesn't bring in any hate that doesn't go away quickly. Honestly, it's just not worth it. Not saying that anyone that feels so strongly about the game is wrong, it's just not my reaction to it. It's hard to get too angry at it when it feels like even after all their chest beating bravado, Volition didn't give that much effort to this. With a story that feels like pages were missing, characters and the map feeling half assed, gameplay being just like every other game out there, and any potential shown feeling like a complete waste. I just have the notion that I spent money on nothing, something that's made to be experienced and then tossed aside. Despite the fact that this is all Volition has had for quite a while, make Saints Row and Saints Row adjacent products. That's all they are now, and they fucked up. Anything I want from them now is a remaster of one so everyone can experience it without having to own an Xbox. Maybe another for two, or at the very least an actual update on the PC port so the base game could have some sense of fucking stability. Maybe a Master Chief Collection style bundle of the original continuity. Other than those, I'm completely fine with Volition just moving the fuck on and Saints Row being taken to the grave so to speak. Just so that many fans, including myself, don't have to go through this shit again. See, there's some anger for you. Last words. Shit. Goddamn fucking shit. Goddamn fucking shit balls on a stick with a side order. A mother loving shit smothered piss covered ass. <laughs> Sorry, didn't catch that. Criminals, sneak thievers, and carjackers Where the streets fight back and shootouts are bound to happen Ain't nobody scrapping, all of these killers is taking action Gang wars, yeah, we bang to the death Gaining respect in the intelligent city Think smart and wear your best Watch your right just as well as your left 